Thank you, Vikram. Uh, just would like to thank first uh, everyone at People Matters. We are on day four of our Hypo Week uh, series of webinars. Um, it's been a great uh, past three days, and we've had a tremendous amount of uh, feedback from all our participants. And we want to thank everyone for joining in. Day four, uh, we have a very interesting topic uh, to start with because uh, it's something which I think all organizations across uh, the world probably are trying to still find a good way to address it. And we have seen on measuring ROI of high potential um, development programs. What is this all about? It's basically more to do with once a hype of program has been designed, implemented, and kind of uh, executed through how are we actually measuring the impact of such a program? What will be the evaluation parameters that uh, one can consider while measuring the impact of the same thing? And how do you ensure that you have chosen the right evaluation parameters for, uh, uh, for measuring the impact? To address these questions and to talk more on this topic, we have a uh, very special guest. Yes, have joined us today and have agreed to co-facilitate uh, today's session for us. First of all, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Can uh, you hear me? Just check. Hi. Um, can all the participants hear me? Just want to check. I got some feedback. Okay, great. So um, without any uh, further ado, just want to check again. Today to use the topic to um, for today's topic we are talking on measuring ROI of high potential development programs and answering some questions around what are the evaluation parameters that we can um, go with while measuring the learning impact. What also we'll be uh, talking about is how do we ensure we are choosing the right evaluation parameters. I introduce today's two um, facilitators. I'd like to first uh, talk about Mr. Robin Boomer, who has uh, joined us from Knowledge Advisors. He is a client solution manager at Knowledge Advisors for Asia. Um, he provides consultation, design, and training and support for learning and human capital measurement solutions using Medtrack Matter uh, for the impact region. Robin has um, brings with him a wide range of experience in using metric-based approaches to drive organization change in business and working uh, in the past with both education and technology-based uh, solutions across all the industries. The ASEAN facilitator for today is Dr. Rick Roy, who, who is um, representing Right Management. He's our global center of excellence head for talent management practice also leads the practice for the um, Asia Pacific region. So um, with, without any um, further delay, I'd re uh, request uh, Rick to please uh, um, start his uh, um, slides. Uh, thank you very much, Dohina. Is uh, volume is okay? Dohina, you are fine. Okay, excellent. Yeah, any of the participants, if you have any trouble hearing uh, myself or Robin today, please just use the chat bar to let us know so we can fix the volume situation. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, very pleased to be joining the day four of the Hypo Week, putting on the very important topic of measuring business impact of high potential programs and high potential program investments. This is a field, for those of you that have been in the field for a while, as I have since the 1980s, you have this field of measuring the business impact of organizational interventions has gone through a transformation over the years, and in many points of view and texts that have developed. Uh, today we want to present a, we can call the middle ground, which is how do we efficiently impact and cool evidence that executives will 
uh, agreed to on the impact of high potential programs. And just to set the context, the reason it's important to measure high potential programs, number very they're high investment programs. Typically, the cost per participant is higher for a high potential program, of course, than a standard type of learning and development program. Secondly, we're getting the future of the company and these future leaders. So we ensure that we select them correctly, we uh, assess them correctly, we develop them correctly, and ultimately we redeploy them laterally or vertically into expanded roles, and we do that with care, we do that, and we do that with measurement. That measurement. So that's the important um, element around high potentials. And the other point is, Consider high potentials is a learning intervention, of course, but fundamentally, it's an organization development intervention. So, by identifying the future leaders, putting these leaders on developing future state capabilities, we back developing future state organizational capabilities. And so for us, hypo is both individual impact as well as organizational impact. Intervention if it's done well and done according to global best practices. So, with that, I want to share some best practices with you first. But let's take a look first at a national say that we ran. Uh, companies, India, and company leaders are saying about measuring high potential. Uh, programs. Next slide, please. Tahina, can you advance my slide, please? Yeah, thank you. And, um, and up the full slide here, that would be fine. With the data on it. So, as we did a national survey a little while back, Asking business sponsors, those are executives who own high potential program development and ultimately sign off on the budget. The managers, those are learning development, organization development, talent management professionals that are running, designing and running, the, administering the, the high potential programs, and finally participants that have gone through a high potential program. So we've asked them around 20 questions each, looking at uh, how they're measuring high potential programs and what is working and what's not working. So. I won't go through the, all the details here, but you can see we've got chief HR, of, uh, chief human resource officers, some CEOs, chief learning officers, uh, and down through uh, HR L and D specialists. Rep multinationals in in, in the, around 25 of the large conglomerates, and then some other um, companies that participated. So next slide, please. them, how do you measure the effectiveness of high potential programs? And we got some interesting responses. The the blue bar represents the response from the program managers, the people who are responsible for administering the programs. The 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 red or the uh, the bar represents the business sponsors that all fund those programs. You can see a, a, a significant difference across the measure the measures opinion between program managers and business sponsors. But and you can see that um we have four basic ways of measuring. If we if we ignore the other and look at uh, tracking high potentials contribution to the organization over three to five years, tracking the success of the hypos once they're transferred to new roles, tracking the retention of hypos is pretty consistent in terms of the responses. Now, interesting, but when we dig into the data, we absolutely see that it is really perceptual data. A lot, not many companies using actual metrics and KPIs to back up the metrics. So if we go to the next data set here, you'll see we asked how specifically, uh, what metrics have you used to measure the ROI of high potential programs? And you see that uh, are using metrics. Good, uh, three quarters of uh, the companies, our business sponsors as well as program managers say, no, we do not have specific measure KPIs for measuring the impact. About a quarter of the companies have some metrics in place. So there's a disconnect between what we perceive we're measuring and what's important to us. We're actually applying a rigorous approach to measuring impact of high potential investments over time. 
what we want to do is address this gap today and talk about how leading companies are, in fact, measuring the ROI or the business impact of, of high potential programs. So, Nick, please. So, look at the key challenges for high potential programs. I want to start first with measuring individual impact. This is important to learn in development professionals, and of course, is extremely important to participants going through the program. I want to mention, though, what's different about high potential programs versus regular uh, manager in role manager development? We are trying to prepare these individuals for next level role. In our definition of high, po, high potential leader, is a high performing manager that can seed at one to two levels above their current position next two to five years. So when we're looking at that, we have to make some educated guess of does that person have the potential to succeed in competencies or capabilities at one or two levels above current role. We need to test them against that to assessment. Then we need a way for them to practice the next level roles. We use hypo action learning model for that, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. But before we get into that, sorry, uh, previous slide, there we are. Uh, there are base building blocks of leadership potential. If you look at the research on the psychology of leadership, depending on you work with management or business school or someone else, you will see slightly different variations on this. But finally, we've got cognition, which is uh, reasoning skills, numerical spatial, verbal reasoning skills, uh, and those are relatively stable throughout the lifetime. If we talk about cognitive skills, we're talking about job fit or role fit versus something that you can grow in any reasonable period of time. So using the right, we have this grow versus fit, fit versus flexible. There are elements of the psychology of leaders that are relatively fixed, and there are elements that, are, that can be grown and changed. We all call this teachable fit. In other words, when we make a higher or we look at a high potential promotion, teachable is the gap. And is it, it can close the gap or is it really a relatively stable quality of that leader? Personality traits, are, the research is clear. Personality is relatively stable throughout the lifetime. This again, is a fit issue versus a development issue. Um, learning capabilities, we do believe, can grow interest in learning, openness to feedback, self-awareness, emotional intelligence, those elements can be developed. Leaders, of course, leader skills, leadership capabilities. Motive factors, which are core values, needs, beliefs, and drivers, relatively fixed through our lifetime. And then additional components around culture fit, technical fit, uh, technical uh, ability, so forth. Depending on the depending on the aspect, could be grow or could be fit. So you are setting up a high potential program and you're working with individual candidates uh, and participants. It's very important for them to understand and for us to understand, as the people signing, administering the program, what is teachable and what is fixed. Uh, one, fixed elements are for self-awareness and self-management, and of course, flexible elements are for growth and development. On that, please. So let's look at some best practices for designing high potential programs for maximum business impact. We have a three-phase approach we call high potential action learning model. This is our patented global approach to assessing, developing, and uh, accelerating uh, high potential leaders. Of course, with an accurate definition of what defines a high potential within your organization. We have three primary components that we assess here in phase one, we call orientation and assessment phase of high potentials, uh, is agility. And give credit to Conferi. They did a great job of defining learning agility as a critical predictor of high potentials. We feel there's more to the, question, there's more to the equation than that. So we measure uh, operational, strategic, interpersonal agility. We measure career aspiration and mobility Mobility, very important aspect for high potentials. And then finally, is around organizational confidence in the individual to lead uh, the company forward. 
So organizational impact from confidence side, the ability factors uh, measured through psychometrics, and then the career aspiration and ability, which is particularly important to young talent. So those are the aspects we put together into a basic assessment process or a full-day assessment center, depending on how the client company wants to make that. So phase, we've got the orientation. We always have an executive introduce the program and communicate it to the organization, welcome the participants. We, we recommend some form of um, qualitative, quantitative assessment for individual, and we aggregate that data across the group of participants to do a talent audit or a group report so that we can fine-tune the follow-on development to focus on specific capabilities that matter most to this particular group of potentials or we call high potential cohort. Individual development plans are formed there, and we form action learning teams. And I want to make a formal definition of action learning here because we use it loosely in many environments. We're talking about a strategic business project or challenge that is sponsored by a line executive in the organization that owns that particular challenge or priority. We send learning teams of five to eight people per team, ideally cross-functional. They do a six to 12-month structured process of analysis, root cause, seeing, and innovating, and finally, scenario planning and action planning to resolve that business challenge. Kickoff process for action learning teams. There's a midpoint review to make sure the teams are tracking properly and not getting derailed. And finally, there's a formal business presentation to a group of executives at the end of the program. And what we're trying to do is give these future business leaders direct experience on thinking through, working through, and solving a strategic business issue challenge, which we part of a future job that they're not already in but will be in the future. It gives us a chance, both whether it's the internal training and development team or whether it's us as the consultants, to serve those participants again over an extended assessment process over six to 12 months to validate their gaps are and are we closing the specific leadership gaps for individuals. So that's we, that is the formal definition of, of teams to action learning. Team action learning. We're, we're coming out with a global two global studies with conference board. One is high potentials. One is strategic leadership development. They'll be released later this month. You that action learning. Team action learning is number one choice of leading companies for accelerating uh, high potential development. And two-thirds of the development activity should be non-classroom-based, experience exposure-based, and action learning is a logical format to do that. So that is one. M is uh, a survey uh, we use. We, we, we partner with Metrics That Matter. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that partnership here in a minute before I transition it to Robin. So we have online uh, pre-programmed surveys to do a pre-assessment for each of the participants. So they get that before they come into the program. We, we initiate action learning. Then we go into group-based development, which typically includes a residential. It includes some industry, customer, geographic exposure. Some may be running uh, some international programs and bring your hypos into our markets or key markets for customers to get that kind of exposure. We have to keep it simple. There's four domains that you have to build to be a successful leader. First and foremost, you must know and manage yourself know how to motivate, align, and energize people. You must be able to think strategically and lead strategy execution and uh, lead execution of the strategic plans. Those are the four basic domains that we build leader capability programs around and typically organize our hypo group-based development around. And then midpoint, again, hypo programs, most companies run between six to eight months. Uh, we think 12 months is sort of optimal window for a high potential group ramp. But at midpoint, we should do we should do the second survey, which builds on the first survey, which is shown as M2. Now, in the phase, phase three of the program, is where the uh, action learning teams do business presentations. Uh, we may we may help these individual leaders with stretch assignments 
or critical development experiences to help close the gap. Typically, high potentials become part of succession planning. And then we monitor and assess their growth and prepare them for next level role. We call this phase role readiness. We recommend that you do a third survey at the end of the program. And finally, uh, a post-program survey three to six months after the program. And we also ask the manager to provide input of the impact of the program on the individual's job and performance. We also ask the individual to what degree have you transferred the development of the program into your job and into your job performance. So these four surveys, M1 to M4, we part of MTM to build standard global surveys, multi-language, that start from a pre assessment and work their way all the way through uh, levels one, two, three, and four, if you think about Kirkpatrick's levels. And at the end of four, we're looking for business impact and ROI. If you do more surveys, you get a chance to validate the program over time. You get real-time input, et cetera. And it's not uh, that costly of a process to, to do. So wanna, before I turn it over to Robin, who's going to walk us through the um, the TM. Uh, metrics that matter and knowledge advisors' point of view on how to measure the uh, ROI of leadership programs. I just want to talk very briefly about MTM. Matter is a, a global leading platform for measuring the impact of learning and development programs. Uh, we have co-designed a specific solution with MTM around measuring the effect of leadership development programs, but they also cover other training programs in their work. But MTM and Knowledge Advisors has done, I think they've done a brilliant job of doing this, when it's in consulting and even up until 10 years ago, we use mile sheets, HAP sheets. Some of you are familiar with this. At the end of a program, we ask participants how satisfied they are with the program. Are they likely to use the uh, the, uh, the the skills they developed, et cetera, et cetera. This is a simple way of measuring uh, satisfaction from the participants. We saw other way, uh, all the way towards causal modeling, which is at ROI analysis of leader programs, and we've worked with three global multinationals on doing formal causal modeling ROI studies of their leadership programs. But we believe that the but effective process is somewhere in the middle between smile sheets causal modeling. Uh, and, and metrics that matter has on their board is Brinkerhoff, Alex, and Patrick, three of the gurus around measuring the impact of learning development programs, have done the surveys and the algorithms that we use. And uh, you can get at this uh, in a much expensive, much more complicated way than we used to do when we did full causal studies. So I'll turn it over to Robin now, uh, one of our global partners, uh, and he's going to walk us through some of the advisors' points of view of how to efficiently measure the uh, impact of leadership programs. Over to you, Robin. And uh, thank you for that introduction and a uh, great overview of metrics that matter and what we try to do with knowledge advisors. I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit today um, some practical ways of measuring along the lines that Rick was just talking about. We have limited resources in terms of money, um, uh, skills, as well as people resources to be able to conduct that kind of analysis and get to the ROI in a way that's cost effective and efficient. Um, but first, I want to start out with uh, a story that, that um, speaks to uh, the difficulties that most organizations face in collecting uh, ROI or impact type of data. This was shared by uh, Dr. John Sullivan, who does a lot of work in this area uh, for St San Francisco State University, and printed this at our analytics symposium uh, last year. We have an annual analytics symposium focused on learning measurement and human capital development. And they, the organization was a large global organization who had identified bottom performers with high potential. So were individuals who are performing both their capability levels as perceived by uh, the organization and their managers, uh, and they sought to improve their performance through coaching. 
And so they worked for uh, several years with a major business university in the United States and uh, trained a group of over a thousand people who had rated as performers, three on a uh, one, two, three scale, and sought to improve them from a three to a one. Um, so low, one, one being highest, three being the lowest. And over the course of those two years, they were spending over 13,000 U.S. dollars per person in coaching those low performers with the goal in mind of moving them from a low performer to a high performer. And during that time, for low performers, that was with a one, two years later, was known. And as uh, often happens in a, a large organization, there was a restructuring, and a new uh, officer came into the organization and for a review of the current programs that were going on. And he called this program out in particular because he noticed that it was a significant line item in the budget of the organization and said, tell me about this program. And the leaders of the program, the owners of the program said, oh, it's a great program. Um, you know, we're working with this fantastic business university who helped us to develop the curriculum. Everybody loves the training. And so he said, that's great. What have you done? Tell me how many uh, individuals you've moved from a three to a one, if that's your goal. And they said, well, we don't know. We've developed this program and part of the, the program at the conclusion of the full two years is to do a full causal ROI study and understand you know, what the total return on investment was and what the impact of the program was. And he said, well, that's not acceptable because I know you have the performance ratings from all of those participants that collect each year, so I want you to partner with the HR department and tell me how many of those low performers have now moved to a high performer. And when he did that, fortunate situation that the organization had to come back and tell them that zero participants out of over 1,000 had actually been moved from a three to one, which was the whole purpose of the program in the first place. Obviously, they have the benefits of moving from a low performer to a high performer. If you track the right measures, we can make the assumptions around what benefits that will have in each of those areas. But the purpose of telling this story is to demonstrate that this is not a good way to calculate your ROI. To sink tens of dollars into an individual over the course of several years without getting any indicators of progress throughout the process, as well as having well-defined measures at the outset, um, is not a good investment of resources and it's not effectively starting uh, the, the valuable resources that are being provided to you by the organization. So as Rick shared, uh, in the right management model, we see that the program is designed to have key measurement points throughout the process, both pre, mid, and post program, so tracking those measures as we go along. Uh, so I wanted to share this as a bad example in, in uh, uh, an example of you know the opposite that that right management is doing, so that you can understand where we see to improve those gaps. Okay, so the first thing, the the pre measure phase, really requires that we do a few things to identify the key performance indicators that we're going to use. Now, with most high potential programs, we're really talking about leadership, but these can be other types of outcomes comes depending on what the type of program is going to be. So sometimes we have high potential programs designed for individual individual contributors as well. Um, so these aren't the only measures that we might potentially use, uh, but they're typical for high, high potential programs. Um, and what then to illustrate is really a balance of the types of measures that you want to collect around your program. Most organizations are very good at this, this last section, the efficiency metrics. They tell you how many people we've trained, how many instructors we've utilized, how many training hours there were per participant, and that's well and good. They can also tell you how much their investment was, which is important because, as I said before, we really need to steward 
the investment property and show what we're doing with the money. But what happens is many organizations report this alone or report this along with just that file sheet data that Rick was discussing earlier. And then that the only decisions to be made are whether to cut or reduce the spending on that particular initiative or try to train more people with the same level of investment. And so what we do is seek to provide a balance of measures, not only just efficiency, but also look at effectiveness measurements like quality of the delivery, the amount of knowledge gained, the alignment to the business and the strategy, and the of that skills to the job, which we lar largely can measure through survey-based data. And we also look to bring in outcome metrics that are already being collected in the organization, things like employee engagement scores and retention rates, and your performance ratings, or even the performance ratings of the leader's team members. By providing this culmination of three different types of data points, we can really optimize our investments by enabling a continuous improvement model, which allows us to set goals, make sure that we are meeting those goals, analyze the results that we're getting, and make improvements over time to do so. So I'd like to share with you six approaches that we utilize to evaluate learning impact, and these range from from low investment and simple uh, types of measurement all the way to very complex and high investment. And the reason frame it this way is because, as I said earlier, we do limited resources. And depending on the program, we need to understand what resources we have available and what is the priority in measuring this particular program. Do we need to get roughly reasonable indicators in a timely manner? in order to make key business decisions around who to put through the program, where we need to make in incremental changes to the way we deliver the program, um, and where do we need to understand the causal relationship between what we're delivering and the impact that it will have on our business and the overall strategy of the organization. So I would suggest that each type of program needs to have that decision by key stakeholders so that we can understand what type of business input analysis is appropriate so we collect a method that fits within our range of investment and ability to deliver. So focus today on the first three here because we have a limited amount of time and because they're the most practical and easy for you to start implementing right away within your organizations. So the first is the smart sheet evaluation approach. And, and this utilized in combination with the first three bullets here. So I'll get right into it. Uh, and these typically employ survey methods. The more difficult pr processes, um, like using this impact templates, actual re results correlations between the outcome measures that you're getting uh, and what's being seen through the learning and development path, and then also causal modeling, these require actual results data being guided by the organization typically, um, and some advanced analysis techniques. So we won't focus on these today, but I just want to provide them as context here. So with the smart sheets, uh, we've developed a means of measuring not just the training event, but so the process, the expected impact, and learning reinforcement. So through our research over the past 12 years, We've done extensive analysis to understand what indicators can we measure using surveys that will give us uh, cost-effective, scalable, and timely results, which not only demonstrate the quality of delivery with the level one reaction scores and the expected uh, learning effectiveness, but can we also start to predict the impact the business results that we expect to see uh, in terms of the change in job performance, and what of return on investment or expectations can we expect from training by collecting this information as early as possible. And this process has been dated and blessed, uh, as Rick said earlier, by the members of our board uh, who have advised us as, as we go along. And those include people like Don Kirkpatrick, who's 
now retired, but uh, Jim Kirkpatrick still sits on our board and is kind of carrying the torch there, as well as Jack and Patty Phillips from the ROI Institute, uh, Josh Burson, Jack Fitzends, uh, Robert Rinkerhoff of the Success Case Methodology. So all of those methodologies are embedded within our Smartsheet evaluations and can be leveraged to make sure the things that are most critical to understanding the impact of, of the training. Uh, do this in a way that allows us to, like I said, not only reflect but also predict, and then we can come back and collect those measures as right man management does um, at a 60 or 90 day interval from the, both the participant and the manager to understand um, where our predictions appropriate and what management support and organizational support issues are there that we need to cut off or we need to address to ensure that we're getting the full impact of the training being provided. The second is the human capital approach, and this falls in line with the Phillips ROI methodology of calculating a financial ROI relative to the improvement in human capital performance. What this means is that you use the improvement in job performance as the overall measure of business impact, and that works as a proxy to understand how much additional we've additional value we've created in our employees to provide them additional uh, salary. So that gain in performance set no additional cost in terms of our human capital investment. So I won't talk through this in too much detail, um, but it's built on the principles of estimation, isolation to the training event specifically and the opportunity for um, actually implement the types of training that's being conducted on the job, and then adjustment for bias as well as some confidence uh, and conservatism. So we want to be sure that we are reporting this information in a way that is responsible. So we take the uh, estimated impact of, of all factors, including this particular training program on the performance of that group of individuals and then relate it to just the training impact and then we reduce that further by the amount of time spent on that particular activity on the job. It allows us to to provide this uh, ROI. Okay. Now we think as a soft ROI measure or a proxy ROI measure but I do want to demonstrate really quickly that this has the validated approach. We have done extensive studies to um, compare this to statistical analysis methods as well as stakeholder interview methods uh, to confirm that the results that we get from this method on just the post of evaluation, so just the one that occurs right after training takes place, is uh, one line with it's the same results that we would get from doing something like a time motion study with statistical analysis. You can see here that there's very little difference between um, you know, the, the ROI percentage that we're calculating, the benefit cost ratio. Uh, often falls right between the uh, conservatism of the statistical analysis and the optimism of the interview process. So it provides us, like I said, very scalable, repeatable way of capping that ROI information early and continuing to that over time. This is the business result evaluation approach, which we can also leverage the same small uh, sheets for. In this capacity, what we're doing is not only looking at the overall uh, impact of training, but looking at which specific business areas it's impacting. So is it increasing sales? Is it decreasing risks, et cetera? Uh, and isolating the effects of the training for that particular uh, business result. And that allows us to go back and work with the organization to isolate the impact on um, those key business areas. So coming back to what we talked about in the beginning about setting your key performance indicators and making sure that there's alignment between the goals of training and the organization, uh, we want to report this information, the efficiency, effectiveness, and outcomes in a single uh, single report. And so this is an example of a 
uh, leader squad that we would provide to an executive to demonstrate how training is impacting our key strategic areas around employee engagement, employee retention, leadership retention, uh, financial management. And you can see from the measures that we're uh, collecting and reporting, there are both actual business measures at the top, and those are the ones that are color-coded against uh, a benchmark or goal, so they're green or red indicated here. And then we also show the number of participants, so some volumetric data, as well as the percent of participants who indicated through um, those effectiveness measures, the survey measures, how many indicated that they felt there would be a significant impact. But we're not reporting any of these in isolation, but like I said, painting a complete picture of what's going on. This falls in line with the talent development reporting principles, which are uh, currently being uh, put forward as the industry standard for all talent development reporting by the Center uh, for Talent Development Reporting, a nonprofit organization that's industry led. So I'd like to hand over uh, to Tina for some Q&A. Thank you. So, um, thank you for uh, sharing all your um, input on um, how we actually measure uh, the impact of leader development programs. So, um, we have been stopped with the questions, and uh, we have our first question for the day. Uh, this is for uh, Rick. So, the question is, can measuring ROI of high potential programs be one of the metrics in uh, an HR scorecard? What would be the weightage or percentage assigned to it? Okay. Um, thanks, Tuina. Um, let's, um, so I'll take that question. Is my volume okay? Yes. No? I can hear you fine. Oh, fine. Okay. So let me, let me try and address this question. So the HR scorecard question, I mean we're talking about the HR scorecard, which is part of the balance scorecard and corporate performance management process. So some of you will know that the balance scorecard as corporate performance management is a very popular way of balancing out um, APIs at the company enterprise level. In the last 10 years, there's been a lot of work done to develop HR scorecards that map, in fact, to the corporate balance scorecard. And Kusilid and uh, Dave Becker and team at, at uh, Rutgers University have published a couple of excellent books, the Harvard Business Press, on HR scorecard and human capital scorecards. So I'm assuming we're talking about this particular element. If I were to include a high potential ROI measure, into the HR scorecard, if it were me, I would follow the methodology that um, Robin has outlined on outcomes, efficiency, and effectiveness. I look at that list, perhaps measure the measures, and roll that up into a weighted ROI score for leadership pipeline. That's how I would do it. Because the R, the, the High potential is a means to an end. In other words, the reason we do high potential programs is so we can improve the quality and depth of the leadership pipeline, what executives care about. Am I confident we're growing next generation leaders with enough depth and enough capability and potential to successfully hand over the leadership of the business to those leaders in the future? Leadership pipeline question leader's pipeline quality, and the metric that goes into HR scorecard should be measuring leadership pipeline quality, leadership pipeline velocity, leadership pipeline depth. That's how we would capture that question. All right? Thank you, Rick. Next question. Yeah. Um, next question is for Robin. Is uh, Can you give an example of an organization Initiatives were taken, and the ROI was computed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
think of the best damn poll that I can here. Um, we we work with a large consumer packaged goods organization that is uh, global in scope, and uh, they have a very large centralized training function where they need to measure the uh, impact of all of their programs, not just their you know high, high potential programs. Um, specifically, but they need to be able to demonstrate that their high potential programs are generating significant additional impact over those that are their typical line of business uh, and their you know, everyday training programs, onboarding, those sorts of things. Um, and so what they do is they actually leverage that smart sheet process in order to measure all of their programs so that they have a baseline of understanding what that typical OI is. And then for their high potential programs, in addition to measuring um, that using that smart sheet evaluation method um, to get a, uh, a good idea of the ROI comparative to their other programs, they also do stakeholder analysis and interviews um, with the business line owners to isolate the effects of the training and understand what the impact of that training is specifically. So they go over and above on the standard for all of their programs to, to uh, demonstrate that uh, specifically for their high potential programs. They do it in several ways. One, they collect pre and post measures from the individual performers on their own uh, performance based metrics. So those could be uh, related to um, those conversions, they can be related. To uh, productivity in terms of, of uh, profit per employee, uh, and they do a pre and post comparison three months uh, prior and three months after the end of training, uh, and then they kind of those three different pieces of information. So their smart sheet evaluation scores, stakeholder analysis, and then the raw data uh, from the uh, pre and post performance measures in order to provide a full picture of the ROI of those key programs. Uh, mm -hmm. We have another question for uh, Rick. So, a uh, reference to the team based uh, action learning projects that you spoke about, uh, the participants have that you've seen teams losing interest in deprioritizing it versus actual business needs. Hence, after a year, the projects, uh, you know, kind of gets uh, left over, left back. How can you avoid a situation like this and handle this more effectively? Yeah, it's an excellent question because we do see high action learning projects that do get scrapped or lose momentum and interest. First of all, I don't think programs should go more than one year. We have companies that try to run 12 and 24 month programs. I think. To happen, the business changes too much, the project loses relevancy, and people just lose focus and momentum. So I think the six to 12 months seems to be the right time for individual development as well as solving a complex business problem. I think to be more selective, one, on the executives, we invite and involve, number two, on the project selection, project criteria, and project metrics. Um, the the, the project should not be selected by the students, participants. They should be selected by a group of business executives that agree on the uh, strategic projects or priorities. And the metrics around solving that business issue should be agreed to from the start. One of the reasons the teams get derailed is they lack a strong action learning process coach. This is the um, either in some cases, we train up the internal HR business partners, development people to run it. In some cases, we do that. In some cases, we share the load uh, by taking, say, two teams each. And there is a, a best practice structured way of and working through the action learning gates from strategic analysis to root cause to solution and innovation to a final business plan. And it should mirror the way that strategic issues are analyzed and reported that the organization is using. So the final team presents their, their review and their insights 
it should be in a similar format and language that is being used by executives to take strategic decisions for the organization. It should not be something different. Um, so th those are just um, ideas. Certainly, I think, and the other thing I want to say um, is that picking the executive sponsors for any leadership program, whether it's mentoring, with high potential action learning should be done carefully. Experience working around the world in many countries with over 80 global corporations now is that many senior executives, the handful, a portion of those leaders that really have a value of giving back and growing leaders and transferring their wisdom to the young leaders of the organization. And there will be a group that don't really care or don't have a value for that. So identifying those leaders that because of their maturity, their age, they've come to a point where they want to start giving back, want to leave a legacy, that organization a better place than when they came, those are the leaders you want to invest in. That's why we also don't promote across the board mentorship programs, saying all executives must mentor high potential leaders because there's a group of those leaders that don't have a value to do it and you'll be constantly prodding them and following up with them. So go where the energy is, find executives that really believe in what we're doing here, and get them to sponsor a project. Those executives that are really hands-on on action learning projects are the ones that succeed. So I, that's just many more details around methodology, et cetera, to help mitigate this, but um, those are my suggestions and a, a quick response here. for a next question. For Robin, uh, how do you isolate the effect of external moderating factors in the environment which could uh, impact the dependent variable? That's good. Uh, and that leads me back to um, kind of that decision making around what type of business act analysis is most appropriate. The uh, first step in doing that is having the conversation with leaders around is that level of analysis required? Uh, because uh, we found um, through extensive uh, research with business executives around learning and development and what their expectations are for measurement is that if we do the measurement piece up front um, communication piece to understand what are you looking for in terms of outcomes. Typically, um, isolating the effects uh, of learning is not one of the key objectives, but make sure that the effectiveness and efficiency of the learning organization is high while the strategic goals are being met and there's some demonstrated correlation between the two based on participant feedback is typically sufficient for leaders to make decisions based on. Now, the culture demands it, or you have an individual stakeholder who requires that kind of causal analysis. We do a causal modeling to do extensive surveying. We would do uh, regression analysis, um, as well as uh, analysis of variance across a large population, and utilize a control group as well to isolate the effects of training along with the context of uh, key stakeholders and observers from within the business. So I have the capability of doing that, but within the system where, uh, that I'm talking about, about, metrics that matter, we are focused on providing scalable, roughly reasonable ways of measuring in a predictive capacity the expected impact will be, rather than taking a reflective look uh, when it's often too late to make business decisions based on what we see in the data. Um, so the, there is usually it's not required, but if it is, we would do uh, an extensive causal analysis. Uh, the next mm -hmm. question that we have is again for Rick. So what are the best practices in getting uh, CXO sponsorship and engagement while creating a high potential journey. 
Uh, yeah, I, I go back to a comment I made earlier. The the, um, the the teaching or the CHRO or whoever is um, responsible for the high potential program, you need to have a good read on the level of readiness and commitment of the individual executives. Um, the CXOs, there, there, there will be a group of them that a value shift typically happens between 45, 55 years old, uh, where you begin to, uh, as a career executive, you begin to feel a sense of legacy, giving back, and transferring the wisdom you've gained over the years to younger leaders. It's a natural value shift that happens for business leaders, but not all business leaders. So I think you need to really keep your bets, understand which executives uh, have this value, and work more closely with a smaller group of executives versus the entire group of executives to get it done. I don't know a better way to do it than to go where the energy is and identify the ones that already have a value shift coming back. They're the ones that will be willing to contribute. The other ones you'll be putting and pushing and begging, and they will be half engaged. And that's, uh, in my view, uh, I wouldn't bother necessarily within those type of leaders that have not had that value shift. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, then we have another question for you. So, um, for the data that you presented, what is the source of uh, the data, and uh, do participants respond by means of self-assessment? Uh, so, there's a different data sources. If we're talking about the this leadership development alignment scorecard, uh, this would be culled from several different places. Uh, it would come from evaluation based data, and that's both self-report as well as observed behavior from managers that would collect both at the um, point of completion of a training program as well as at a follow-up interval, typically of 60 to 90 days, depending on the program and the expected time to application. Um, so we pull that up into effectiveness scores and understanding what the um, participants indicating a significant impact would be. Um, we're also looking at the uh, data from our either learn management system or our um, you know, program management in terms of deployment and, and managing our resources. And then we're also looking at data from the organization, either a data warehouse um, or partnering with the HR or um, productivity. Uh, from the, within the organization to uh, request the data that's necessary to do the analysis. So uh, typically we work with clients on a um, you know one basis to identify based on the KPIs that we've selected and strategy of that organization and program, what are the resources that are available to us, who can we partner with in the business to get the data we need, and then what's the most cost effective and scalable way to obtain that data. Uh, it does come from various uh, sources. The easiest uh, way of uh, getting that data is the, the smart sheet evaluations, which are typically distributed via email and collected on mobile devices or, or um, any you know enabled device, uh, or can be even collect the paper if required, but uh, that typically doesn't uh, provide us with much in terms of administrative savings. Okay, thank you. So um, the next question is for Rick. Uh, how do you decide on fixing the timelines for evaluating effectiveness for behavioral loss of skills development actions? Next question. Um, so as, as a practice, you know, MPM, we build these predictive smart sheets for doing a pre-assessment can be self-assessment or 360 or 180, and self-assessment piece from the start. Um, then, so that's a relatively simple pre-survey. We look at there's two ways to measure midpoint. Use the now the first surveys build on each other. Okay, from level one to level four or level five in some cases, they build on each other, and the questions become more application and ROI based as you work through the four surveys, these independent surveys. And 
reliability over the survey process and then ensures that our programs are headed towards delivering impact. This point we think is important. This goes to the fact that of programs that get derailed during the program. We need a midpoint program review of the hypo potential program itself. We need to check in with the participants and then we need the online survey, the M2, to be completed, which is on M1. Then we can course correct for the second half of the program. At the end of the program, M3 measures basically how the experience, what gaps have you closed in terms of skills, capability, behaviors, uh, how are you now applying those on the job, and look forward to what they will be applying in the future. And somewhere between three, six months, more than six months after the program, run an ex uh, the next version of the survey around job transfer, role transfer, and bit and 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 um, uh, organizational impact questions are added to the manager and to the participant three to six months after the program. Our feeling is if you left a high potential program and you haven't begun to transfer skills and knowledge and in your job performance after three months, you're probably not going to do it at all. That's our point of view. Um, and again, we're talking about anywhere between six months to two months of uh, intensive development program. Many of these hypo programs can take up to 20% of additional discretionary time uh, of these high potentials. And again, these are motivated, driven people that want a business career. They need to be willing to put in the extra time, and we expect them to be applying on the job. And there should also be some decision gates about whether someone should leave the high potential program, either on their own decision or as, as a program level decision made at the midpoint way of the program. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rick, for answering um, the last question. And uh, with this, we will come to the end of our webinar for today. We've uh, just passed our time. And uh, thank you to all the participants who have uh, joined us today and over the past three days uh, as part of the Hypo Week webinar series. Thank uh, both Robin and Rick for uh, presenting today and sharing their viewpoints. I've had uh, some very interesting questions uh, over the past uh, few days, and it's really, really been uh, a kind of um, answer those. So uh, we, I hope that uh, in the next few days you will be also uh, a copy of uh, the Hypovic newsletter, sharing all these inputs which are coming across. Uh, Articles and content that we've been sharing, and we hope that reaches you. So, with uh, I'd like to thank People Matters also for um, you know working us along for uh, all these webinars, and it's been a real pleasure. Uh, over to you, Vikram. Thank you, Nina, um, and thank you to both our speakers, uh, Rick and Robin. Uh, it was a very, very interesting session, and I hope that uh, all of us participants were able to take some very, very uh, practical insights on how we can uh, go and uh, implement them uh, in our own organizations. Uh, lastly, thank you to all the participants uh, for attending the webinar today and also across uh, the entire week. Uh, and, and with this, uh, uh, we conclude uh, the series of webinars for the Hypo Week. Thank you all for your time.